good evening. Good evening, sir. Anil, you have to unmute your microphone. Who, me? Hi there, how are you doing? Yeah, yes. good. I'm good, uh, Anil. After a long time, we see each other. Yes, indeed. Hope everything is all right. And then, yeah, very good, at, thank you. You are at home or in the university? Um, I'm at home at the moment. Okay, okay. And thank you very much for joining us. No problem. This morning. Okay, let me start, okay? Uh, a very good morning to one and all present here. Uh, very good afternoon to, to all the Indian participants and the other participants from the other side of the globe. It's very good morning, okay? Today we have our guest... Uh, Dr. Neil Bunham, who is a plant pathologist with last 25 years experience in interdisciplinary and allied crop research in plant pathology. He worked more than 20 years for the UK DEFRA on plant health and recently moved to University of Newcastle to take up a chair in applied crop research. Neil is interested in how we can use diagnostic data generated using rapid in-field or laboratory methods to help farmers make better decisions about pest and disease management. He is currently the co-director of BBSRC-funded Connected Network, which aims to link people together working on vector-borne plant viruses provide research training and development synergies with research working around the world. I'm so happy to welcome Neil for today's talk. I met Neil in 2012 at uh, FERA. I was uh, a postdoc during that time in uh, FERA, UK. And then since then, our association is continuing. I'm a member of Connected. My students are a member of Connected. And in 2019, we got three students of mine. They got training at uh, University of Newcastle and FERA. So this uh, afternoon, we'll hear from Dr. Neil Bunham. Neil, please, this floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. It's very much. Great. All right, I'm going to try to share my screen. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see how that goes. Okay, can you see my screen? It's coming up. Yes, 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 you can see. Okay, excellent. Okay. <coughs> uh, so I've got a talk for you this morning around uh, the use of molecular diagnostic tools in crop protection. Um, 
I haven't timed how long it's going to take. I think it's likely to be uh, maybe 50 to 60 minutes. Yeah, and that's fine. That's fine. Time, yeah. time afterwards. Um, uh, <laughs> the Okay, can I make it start? Just one second. Okay. okay. If anybody um, does have any questions, um, you know, during the talk, stick them in the chat or, you know, I'm not too fussed about being interrupted. And if we lose connection or, or something, if you can alert me, um, you know, just cut into the into the talk. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So... What I'm really going to talk about this morning, uh, I'm going to use di various different examples to uh, think about this um, this kind of topic of using diagnostic tools to help farmers make good uh, decisions in, in terms of their crop protection. Um, and I'm going to start off just by way of an introduction, which is really the ex what I'm going to talk about to begin with is, is a kind of background in the UK but I think it reads across into many crops around the world and the kind of issues that we've encountered. Uh, really, in the UK, our problem is that we haven't really adhered to uh, integrated pest management approaches in many cases. We've typically been fairly lazy, I would say, about how we've used, how we've controlled pests and diseases in crops. Uh, and our, our main, and in some cases, sole approach has been to use uh, agrochemicals, so pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. We've ignored uh, good principles of integrated pest management, and this has caused us problems. Um, and so I can illustrate this by just talking about one disease. Uh, and this is something, this is a disease that I'll talk about later today, but is by no means the the only disease uh, where this is an issue. So um and indeed, my talk is going to vary between uh, some parts that I'm going to talk about herbicide resistance in uh, grass weeds. And later on, I'm going to talk about uh, fungicide resistance. Uh, I'm not going to talk about insecticide resistance. But these problems are problems across the board. And the, the reasons these are problems are all of the, the really the same um, and are illustrated here just by talking about sectoria. So leaf blotch um, caused by the fungal pathogen Zyma septoria triticae is the most common foliar disease of wheat in the UK and amounts for about £53 million worth of residual losses. So that's losses after the application of fungicides. Most of the fungicides that we use on wheat are targeted against leaf blotch, although we do use fungicides to control other pathogens too, uh, things like mildew, and uh, rust diseases in particular, which is estimated to cost about 80 uh, or so million pounds a year. But as I explained, we've, we've basically been using uh, fungicides in wheat as our main and probably in most instances only method for controlling disease. Uh, so we've continuously used compounds with the same mode of action and that's provided a really powerful selection pressure. Um, resistance to strobulurins were first detected uh, in 2000, and is, you know, by 2003 they were 70% prevalent. So that's just an indication there of how much we were relying on strobulurins. Since then, um, we've encountered resistance to azole fungicides, and also to succinic dehydrogenase inhibitors or SDHI fungicides. And to control septoria and other pathogens in wheat, we're basically reliant on a program um, which incorporates azole and SDHI fungicides. Now, much of our work has been on azole fungicides, and we've been doing surveys um, over the last probably five or six years uh, looking at uh, septoria and azole fungicide resistance. And what we found was we collected probably over that period of time uh, close to a thousand different isolates where we sequenced the target site of, uh, for azole fungicides. And we haven't found a single wild type 
um, of that uh, pathogen any longer. So all of the isolates that we're finding in the field have at least one mutation associated with resistance to azole fungicides, which I think gives another indication about how we're misusing these um, crop protection products. Uh, you know, if our populations no longer contain wild types, then, you know, there's no chance that those fungicides have a long um, lifespan anymore. But the other problem that comes on the back of this is around new chemistry. So our reliance on uh, fungicides and the use of fungicides in this way has been really also reliant on the fact that agrochemical companies would discover and release new chemistries. So we, in effect, our, this isn't intentional, but our approach has been to use chemistry, probably overuse chemistry, and then expect the big agrochem companies to release new chemistry that we could then start to use. And to be fair, that's served us reasonably well over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but if you think about how this is going, the, you know, the pipeline of new chemistry is drying up. So if we look at the data, there's not a huge amount of data on this because a lot of this is uh, in confidence with the companies, but it was thought in about 2000 that there was about 70 new active ingredients in the development pipeline. This is across all of the big ag chem companies. But by 2012, so almost a decade later, there was only about 30. So, you know, almost halving over that decade. And the costs have increased dramatically. Um, this is data from, you know, almost a decade earlier. But during that period, 95 to 2005, it's estimated that the costs of bringing new chemistry through uh, the development pipeline has, has pretty much doubled. And the other thing that we've seen that I haven't put on the slide is the impact of, of regulation. So regulation has been removing a lot of the crop protection products. Uh, from use uh, in Europe um, because of concerns about um, safety, in particular environmental safety. Uh, one of the big withdrawals in recent years has been the withdrawal of neonicotinoid insecticides, uh, which were heavily relied on in some sectors for control of insect pests. Uh, and they were withdrawn uh, a couple of years ago. And how are we doing with this? Because, you know, this is ultimately the, the really interesting thing. And this is data from a colleague of mine at Ferro Science Limited, uh, where they, they looked back at the average number of sprays, uh, fungicide sprays for control of septoria. So these are only sprays that are applied, for, you know, directly for septoria. And that's in the purple uh, line here. And in the blue bars in the histogram underneath, is the disease assessments for septoria. So this is percentage of disease at leaf two. That's on this axis here. And what you can see is over the years, we've continuously increased the amount of spraying uh, that we're doing for septoria. So now the average is between three and a half and four sprays. Um, so yeah, growers are effectively using either three or in most cases, four sprays for the control of septoria. Yeah, if you look at disease incidents, it's not in any way correlated. So, you know, we basically have good years and bad years. Um, recently, we have had some bad years here. But we've also had some very good years where we've seen very little disease. And that tells you that the amount of spraying that we're doing has got nothing to do with the amount of disease that we're seeing. Um we're just continuously increasing the amount that we're spraying, uh, but we're not really looking at the risk of disease, which is not a very good place to be, I would say, uh, and probably also explains many of the things that I put in the previous slides. So most of this talk then is going to think about this problem here. So can diagnostic data help us to spray the right product? Um, and can it help us to spray the right product at the right time? So there's kind of two issues here. One thing is about which product we're going to select, why we're selecting that product. And the other thing uh, there is about are we using it at the right time? 
a lot of these fungicides, if we if we stick to fungicides uh, and septoria, most of them are preventative. Uh, most of them don't have a curative mode of action. So, you know, if you spray them too late, they're also not very effective for control. So timing is really important. We need to get them on at the right time. Uh, but we obviously need to select the right product that's also going to be effective. And so our hypothesis here really is, can we generate diagnostic data rapidly um, that would help us to, to um, add to, to these two questions? So would it help us to select the right product? Would it help us to do so at the right time? And in doing so, um, I would hope that we would get multiple outcomes. So we'd probably use less product. The product that we would use is more effective. And the sustainability of using these products uh, would be increased over time. And in many cases, what we're looking to do is use point of care or in-field diagnostics. So point of care testing for agriculture um, really means farmers or agronomists going into the field, taking a sample, testing it whilst they're in the field uh, and getting a, a result that's sufficiently uh, quick that they would be able to act on that result. Um, so this isn't really collecting samples, sending them to a lab, uh, waiting for a while to get a result and then acting on that result, although that could be how this is deployed. But a lot of the examples I'm going to give you are about point of care, or in the case of agriculture, in-field diagnostics. And thinking about whether we can accurately identify pest species, improve timing of spraying, and accurately identify the potential resistance status of pests to agrochemicals. And I'm going to stick, uh, for most of this talk, to the second and third of these two points. So we're going to think about resistance status, and we're going to think about timing of spraying. And the platforms that I'm going to talk about um, are on the right-hand side, and the pests on the left. I'm not going to talk about insecticides today. I'm going to talk about septoria. I'm going to talk about uh, the control of grass weeds uh, in cereal crops. And I'm going to talk about three different diagnostic platforms. So two of them are based on DNA analysis, and I'm also going to talk about a protein uh, platform. So I'm going to talk about uh, LAMP on the Genie system. I'm going to talk about high throughput sequencing using the MinIron system. And I'm going to talk about uh, protein detection and quantification uh, using lateral flow devices. So the first piece of work I'm going to talk about is detection of resistance mutations uh, using DNA markers and the development of LAMP methods for detecting uh, single base pair changes, in this case in black grass, and that these uh, changes uh, lead to target site resistance. <laughs> And this is work that's been done by two of my colleagues at Newcastle University, uh, now Paul on Kokosong and Alina Goldberg uh, Cavallari. And the, this work's been done in my lab and also in Rob Edwards' lab. Um, so herbicides then, um, and the use of herbicides in the UK, at least to control grass weeds. Uh, we've got two different classes, what are referred to as group one, which are the ACCA's inhibitors, and group two, which are the ALS inhibitors. And these are the common selective herbicides used for uh, control of black grass, but also other wild grasses, both in, in, in cereal crops in the UK, but also around the world. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is mutations in within the target site, so within the ACCAs and the ALS enzymes. And these mutations confer resistance to a specific chemical class of herbicide. Uh, target site resistance doesn't confer cross resistance to other modes of action. So as described in this diagram here, so we've got the enzyme for ACCAs, the enzyme for ALS, and we've got the target site of these enzymes and the products that we're using bind into the target site and inhibit the enzymes. And so the triangle here and the uh, pentagon here are, are two, um, just a cartoon really for the uh, different herbicides. And this is in a sensitive um, plant cell. And in a resistant plant cell, what you get is changes 
or mutations that cause the uh, active sites of these enzymes to mutate, change shape, such that the herbicides no longer bind into that active site. And so the enzymes are active. They may not be as active as they were previously, uh, but they enable the survival of the cells and therefore the plants, and they effectively evade the action of the herbicides. And this is what's known as target site resistance. And later on in the talk, I'm going to talk about the, the other mechanism of resistance, uh, resistance. But for now, I'm just going to con concentrate on target site resistance, uh, for short TSR. And this is how this uh, looks. This is a mutation or several mutations within uh, the ALS gene of um, blackgrass. What you can see at the top is the wildlife, uh, wild type sequence. Um, where you're not, you don't see any mutations and you don't see any changes. And in the two sequences below, you've got these amino, uh, nucleotide uh, sequence changes here, and these are le leading to these um, amino acid changes. So in the wild type, we should have a proline at this position, and the two mutations here code for either threonine at this position or a histidine at that position. So these single base pair changes code for these amino acid changes, and these amino acid changes um, result in changes to the active site of the enzyme, such that the herbicide can no longer bind. And those changes lead to mutations um, that lead to resistance. And here's just a couple of examples. So within the ALS gene, these are the mutations that you see. And an example here, this mutation leads to resistance to this product. And in the case of AL, uh, ACCAs, again, a mutation to isoleucine at this position within the gene leads to resistance to these products. So you can see some mutations lead to resistance to several products where the binding site is similar, and some of them lead to uh, just resistance to single products. And so what I'm going to talk about is, is the use of diagnostics based on loop-mediated amplification uh, to detect for the detection of these uh, base pair changes. So loop-mediated amplification, I'm not going to go into the mechanism of how it works, um, but I'll put a YouTube link here. Uh, if you go onto that uh, YouTube link, or you go into YouTube and search for uh, LAMP DNA amplification, you'll get cartoons explaining how this works. It's effectively, you could think of it as a modification of PCR. So whereas PCR uses an enzyme and two primers to specifically amplify a fragment of DNA, um, which means that you can amplify um, a fragment of DNA from your target of interest, the modifications for LAMP means that you use three pairs of primers and a different enzyme, and that enables you to uh, do amplification at a single temperature. So you don't have to thermal cycle uh, the reactions like you do with PCR. And the benefits of this uh, are several fold. Firstly, because you do it at a single temperature, you don't need to use a thermal cycler. So you can just incubate this at a single temperature. So the equipment to do that is much um, less expensive. The enzyme is much more robust, so it's less prone to inhibition. So you can put um, quite crude sap extracts into the reaction. So you don't need to isolate the DNA in advance. And the third thing is it's very fast. So a reaction here is likely to take somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Whereas for PCR, you might be looking at an equivalent reaction that probably takes somewhere between one and two hours. So it's a bit more suited to use in the field. The reaction also creates a very large amount of DNA. And that large amount of DNA uh, enabled you to see the DNA using a fluorescent reader that's a lot less complex than the one that you might need uh, for seeing the small amount of DNA, relatively speaking, that is amplified by PCR. But this is how this uh, method looks in reality. So you take a piece of um, 
of the leaf of interest, put it into an Eppendorf tube with a stainless steel ball bearing and some uh, buffer, shake it up for a minute to extract the DNA, take some of that sap extract and put it into the reaction tubes and then put it onto the Genie uh, machine. In this case, we're running the reaction for 30 minutes. So we're not really doing DNA extraction. We're just homogenizing the cells to release the DNA into the sap extract. Uh, and then we're putting that directly into the reaction mix uh, to run on the Genie instrument. And this is the example of some of the results. So we worked with a company called GeneSys, uh, who developed a whole new chemistry that enables us to discriminate these mutations. Now, this is a little bit complex. Um, but what I can show you here is a mutation that leads to an isoleucine at this position within ACCAs. And what we're looking at here is the shift in melting temperature of a binding probe that binds to the DNA that we've amplified. So if we start on the right-hand side, this is the temperature that the probe should bind at in a, in a wild type. So there's no mutation here, and we've got a wild type, and we should see a melting uh, profile at around 59 degrees. And we can see multiple mutations at this location. So we can see a mutation that leads to a shift in the melting peak to 54, and we can see another mutation that leads to a shifting in the melting temperature to about uh, 50 degrees. What you can also see here, so we can see homozygotes here, uh, and in yellow and in red. So this is wild type homozygote and the two mutations as homozygotes. But you can also see heterozygotes. So there's one here where we've got um, a wild type allele and we've also got a mutated allele. So we can look at uh, individual plants and see whether they're homozygotes or heterozygotes for the mutations that lead to resistance. This is a slightly simpler one. This is a mutation that leads to aspartic acid at position 2078 within the ACCA's enzyme. And again, no mutation over here, seeing... Um, a melting temperature at about 60 degrees, and then where we see the mutation, in this case, a homozygous mutation um, at about 53 degrees. So you can clearly see the shifts in, in annealing temperature here of the probe detected on the Genie machine uh, within half an hour it tells us whether these mutations are present. So in summary then, the good thing about running lamp assays on the Genie is relatively fast. The example that I showed you for SNP detection takes about between 20 and 30 minutes. We usually run it for 30. Um, but for some um, applications, so that, for example, identifying an insect pest where you're not looking uh, in a background of plant uh, DNA, it may only take you five minutes to do the amplification. It's relatively inexpensive, costs about £10 per sample. And we're able to discriminate uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms um, with the new chemistry that was developed here. Um, multiplexing isn't possible. Now, this is a potential problem. In an ideal world, we'd like to test populations. <clears throat> so... If you imagine within a wheat field, you've got different patches of black grass. Within those patches of black grass, you've got a population of a grass weed. Uh, because black grass is an outcrossing species, there's also variation. So there's variation in terms of the incidence of the uh, mutations within the population. And to identify that, you need to do a number of samples within each population. <coughs> There's also a number of different mutations. So we've got different mutations within the ALS gene, different mutations within the ACCA's gene. So in order, in order to test populations, you've got to multiply the number of samples by the number of uh, single base pair changes. And this could prove costly. So 
And for looking at individuals, it's very quick and inexpensive. But to look for populations, it could start to become expensive. And that's something that I'm going to come on to later with a different technology and a different application, but really looking at this um, issue of being able to test for mutations within populations. So moving on to the second example, and this is detection uh, of a resistance based on a protein biomarker. And this is development of a quantitative LFD, and this time for non-target site resistance within black grass. This is the LFD on the right-hand side, and this is work that's predominantly being done by uh, now upon on Kokosung again at Newcastle University. So non-target site resistance, unlike target site resistance, is a type of resistance that's uh, where you get resistance to multiple modes of action. And it's also a quantitative resistance. So this means that um, the more of the changes that are happening in the plant, the greater the resistance. So it can be scalable. So you can start off with a small amount of resistance and it develops into exceptional amount of resistance. So if you think about target site resistance is more or less on off. Um, you either have a mutation and it's resistant. Or you don't have a mutation. It's not resistant. Or you have non-target site resistance, um, which is quantitative. And it also provides resistance to multiple different herbicides with different modes of action. And there's various different mechanisms uh, for this type of resistance. Um, and I'm just going to talk here about one type of mechanism, um, which is metabolic resistance. So this is the plant uh, increasing its metabolism and its detoxification biochemistry to basically break down uh, herbicides. And the work that uh, was done in Rob Edwards' lab um, was basically a proteomics um, study in the first instance. So what they did, they took field collected populations here from different locations in the UK and experimentally selected populations that were resistant to uh, different, uh, different herbicides. And what they did um, using proteomics was look for proteins here that were upregulated in all of these different populations. So they were looking for something here because that would mean that they were resistant in the field and they were resistant to multiple different herbicides. And what they found was one protein, uh, and they've subsequently characterized other proteins, but at least one protein called AMGSTF1, which was upregulated in all of these populations. And as a result of being upregulated in all of these populations, they thought that it must be uh, central to um, the initiation of herbicide resistance or multiple herbicide resistance. And because it was a protein, um, we were interested whether we could develop a rapid uh, protein test to detect this protein. And so what we started to do was look at um, these lateral flow devices. So lateral flow devices, the same technology is used in a pregnancy testing kit. In a pregnancy test, you're testing for a, a hormone and an increase in a hormone. What we wanted to do here was detect the increase of this AMGSTF1 protein uh, within grass weeds um, and monitor that upregulation. Uh, so you can see here an LFD reader, and this reader is going to look at the intensity of the line and tell us how much of this protein we've got. So not just is it present, but how much of it is present. So this is the layout of a uh, lateral flow device. Um, this is what's inside the uh, lateral flow device. So you've got a sample pad where you add your sample. You've got colloidal gold, which is coated in antibodies. In this case, it's coated with the antibodies to the uh, AMGSTF1 protein. And then on the membrane, you spray antibody lines um, 
that are also uh, specific for this AMGSTF1 protein. So when you add your SAP sample onto here, these um, colloidal gold particles coated in antibody are hydrated and they start to move along the membrane um, using capillary action. When they get to the test line, um, if AMGST if protein is present, they bind onto there. The more of that protein that's present, the more of the colloidal gold binds onto this line. And that's how you can see that it's a quantitative test. So the more of it that binds here, the more intense that line. And so we use that quantification. Um, we measure that intensity of that line, and it tells us how much AMGSTF1 is in the plant. The rest of the colloidal gold that doesn't take part in the reaction continues to flow across the membrane as absorbed over here. And this is some results from various different populations uh, to, to describe this. So what we've got over here is the different populations. Um, what we've got here is the reading of the test line. So this is the uh, reading of the LFD test line. And what we've got here are a range of different herbicides. And underneath, we've got the susceptibility or resistance. So what you can see here is it's quantitative. So we've got all the way from susceptible um, to low level resistance to very high level of resistance for different products. And what you can see here, for some of these population populations, a couple of them we haven't tested, but some of them have low level resistance or very high level resistance, but in this case to multiple different products. And this one here is a wild type, so this one is susceptible to all of these products. And what you can see is that's correlated to the reading that we're getting for AMGST. So with the susceptible population, we get a reading in the low 20s, and that increases uh, to this population here, where we're getting readings twice of the susceptible, um, and we're getting resistance to multiple different products. So this is a quantitative type of resistance. Uh, and this is measuring uh, the AMGSTF1 protein um, using ELISA. And you can also see this in Western blots. So you get a, a small response um, from the wild type uh, susceptible population and an increasing response with the resistant populations. Now, porn also has been exploring whether this is a common um, phenomenon across other wild grass uh, weeds. So most of the work that she's done is on black grass, but she's also used the antibodies and the test to see whether AMGSTF1 antibodies can detect this protein in different grass species, and also whether it can detect um, an increase in this protein associated with resistance. And these are just some data uh, from ryegrass and for wild oats, um, which are also grass weeds of, of concern in the UK and um, for some of these in other countries, so wild oats in particular in North America. It's a more important um, cereal weed than blackgrass, but in uh, Northern Europe, blackgrass is a more important cereal weed than wild oats. And what you can see here um, is that we do see an increase. So where we've got resistance uh, here and here and also in wild oats, um, we do see an increase in AMGSTF1 uh, protein. And you can see it both in ELISA on the left, uh, on the right hand side, sorry, on Western blot analysis on the left hand side. So, in summary, then, the lateral flow device is, is probably the most rapid of all of the tools that we've got, only takes about five minutes, and it's inexpensive, uh, costs about £10 per sample. Um, we do need a little bit of equipment here, but it's much less expensive uh, to read the intensity of a line on a lateral flow device than it is to read the results of a Gini reaction. Uh, so we can test for the presence and we can test for the abundance of the biomarker. And for black grass resistance, we're interested in the abundance. And we do, at this moment, use a reader. Um, the reader that I showed you in the picture 
is about 200 pounds, um, but we've started now to use readers uh, based on a smartphone. So we can measure non-target site resistance in a range of different wild grasses. Uh, so it works not just on black grass, but on also on some other grass species uh, by monitoring the MGSTF1 protein. Um, provides a simple way of generating data on presence and abundance um, for non-target site. And we can do it in populations, either by testing multiple samples, or we can pull together small numbers of samples, LFD, to get an indication of resistance in populations. Okay, moving on, this time to fungicide resistance populations. Um, and, and how we can resolve those populations. So I mentioned populations quite a few times. And the reason that I've mentioned it is that, you know, in a field situation, we're really interested in populations. Um, fungal diseases don't spread around as isolates. We don't have clonal populations. We have multiple uh, individuals making up populations. And we really need to know about those populations. And... So what we're interested in this project is, can we use high throughput sequencing uh, using the MinION system here, which is a relatively low cost, high, th high throughput sequencer, to examine populations? And the example that I'm going to give you here is we're back to septoria and fungicide resistance. But you could use the same technology to look at uh, populations of blackgrass for target site resistance or indeed insects for insecticide resistance. And the work here was done, uh, by again, by a collaborator, in this case, a postgraduate uh, research student called Yaitha Guterres. And here I'm going to explain uh, why we're most interested in population. So this is a really simple uh, diagram of what a population is. So this is the population. We've got the wild type in red and the resistant um, isolates in black. And we're going to spray here with fungicide X. So fungicide X is going to kill all of the wild type fungal pathogens. Um, it's going to leave the resistant ones behind. Those ones are going to spread within the crop. And if we spray with fungicide X again, it's going to no longer um, be effective against this population. And the population is going to proliferate. Now, I've made a few adjustments to this simplified diagram to describe what we're seeing when we look at septoria in the UK. So as I mentioned earlier, we no longer see wild-type pathogen. What we see is pathogens uh, with various levels of sensitivity making up these populations. So we've got a population here. It's much more complex, a whole range of different um, haplotypes of the pathogen um, with different uh, levels of sensitivity. So here we spray with fungicide X, and in this case, it's knocking out one of those um, haplotypes. The remaining haplotypes continue to proliferate, um, and what we tend to do in the UK is alternate between different modes of action. So in this case, we spray with a different fungicide, fungicide Y. Fungicide Y continues to remove some of those haplotypes, um, in this case the purple ones, but we're still left with the other resistant haplotypes. So we've got a much more complex situation in the field to deal with. And it's these populations that we want to be able to de detect. So our work here, or Yaitha's work here, was to look at these populations and high throughput sequencing to see whether we could um, figure out who are in these populations, so which haplotypes are present, and also how many are present, so how many of the different haplotypes. And finally, to see whether we could do that quickly so that we could look at a population like this. And instead of going in immediately with fungicide X, we would look at the population, make a selection based on what we see of the fungicide, and then be able to do that later. So look at this population again very quickly and then make a selection for, for the second fungicide that we would use. Now, I mentioned the um, haplotyping that we did uh, with a genie for, for blackgrass. Now, we also did that for resistance in uh, fungal pathogens in septoria. 
And here's some data here, uh, simplified data. Now, it does work. Um, and But as I mentioned earlier, this is great if you've got an individual. So for blackgrass, this works reasonably well. You can go and take a leaf from a blackgrass plant. But when you look at fungal um, populations, to get to those clonal um, individuals, you need to culture the pathogen. So you would need to collect samples from the field. You need to culture all of those different organisms. And then you would be able to test them using this kind of system. So we wanted to know, could you look at those populations um, collectively? The other limitation we had is that if we look at, uh, if we just focus on azole resistance for now, uh, that's caused by mutations within the CYP51 gene. Uh, so there's a large number of SNPs within the gene itself. There's also a number of inserts within the promoter that lead to upregulation of the gene. Um, so what we want to do here is be able to, amp to look at all of these different mutations across the whole of this gene. Uh, so there's a large number of SNPs. We need to know how many and which SNPs are present uh, within the population. And we need to be able to convert that to haplotype. So we don't just want to know uh, if the SNPs are present, but we want to know which SNPs belong to which SNPs within a population. So we also need to look at a rather long gene here. So we actually amplify about 3,000 nucleotides uh, to get to the gene in the promoter here. And although high throughput sequencing is the obvious way to look at mixtures and to look at populations, um, if we look at Illumina sequences, sequencing, which is what we mostly use, it would enable us to look at population, but it doesn't do long reads, so it only enables us to look at short fragments. Whereas Minion sequencing has a number of benefits. It enables us to look at populations. It enables us to look at long reads. So 3KB is relatively straightforward. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. But the problem that we had at the start of this work and that we were trying to resolve is, is it too error prone to enable us to look for single base pair polymorphisms? So to begin with, we looked at this question of um, errors. We did this using a small of the nanoparticle angle. The less less. So one one run on a flock uh, costs about hundreds, and you can look at a whole range of different isolates. Uh, or samples on one flongal. So you could pull together, say, 100 samples, in which case you're getting sequence data for probably about a dollar per sample. And this is the output of the uh, sequencing data. So what we did, um, these are the uh, isolates here. So these are a number of different isolates collected from the field. This is the insertion uh, site and the size of the insertion. And then these are the positions of mutations. And as you can see, there's a large number of mutations. Uh, this one, this isolate here uh, is the wild type. So this is the amino acid that you should see, uh, should have no insertion. And then these are all haplotypes that we've seen in the UK. So with insertions, uh, some don't have insertions. Some have small numbers of mutations. So here you've got some isolates which have just uh, four mutations. Um, and then you've got some which have many more. Some have deletions. So this amino acid is deleted. And what this shows is this is data from the fungal. Um, and we compared this data to the same isolate sequenced using Sanger sequencing. Um, so these were isolates that we'd collected, isolated the pathogen, uh, isolated individual colonies so they were clonal and sequenced them using Sanger sequencing and Minion sequencing. And we were able to get the same results. So we were able to see these amino acid sequences, uh, these single base pair changes in the amino acid sequences. So then we moved on to populations. Um, and to begin with, we made mock populations. So we took 
we made simple populations to begin with. So we took these two isolates here and we mixed them in various proportions. So top and bottom, we've got 100% of this isolate and the bottom we've got 100% of this isolate. Um, and what you can see is everything in between. So where we decreased this isolate and we increased this isolate. And then we've got the different mutations. So these are the mutations we would expect to see in this isolate here. And these are the mutations that we see in the other isolate. And this number in the table looks at each of the amino acids and tells us how far away our results are from the proportion or the percentage of this first isolate. So where we see naught, that means that we actually see a 50-50 result. Um, but where we see um, minus one, it means that we were 1% away. So you can actually see for most cases, we're pretty close. So we're, we're within one or two, 3% uh, of, of the um, mock population that we made up. For some mutations, you can see it's worse. So this mutation here, um, we see the two mutations and we see reasonably close to the proportions, but there's some noise here. So we're more than 5% uh, away from the true result. And you can see these tend to be associated with runs of nucleotides. So we've only got C's and T's here and we've got runs of nucleotides. So we've encountered these systematic errors where the amino acids uh, are coded by runs of uh, nucleotides. And that's something about the mechanism by which the Oxford nanopore system works uh, causes problems with runs of nucleotides. But it wasn't too bad. That was with simple uh, mock populations. And we went to more complex mock populations. So in this case, a population made of three different isolates. This is what we made what we mixed together, so 20, 60, 20%. And this is what we observed afterwards. And again, what you can see is the proportions are reasonably close to the uh, actual proportions. So here it should be 20, 60, 20, and we've got 18, 65, 16. And where it should be 10, 80, 10, we've got about nine and a half, 82, and about eight. So not too far away. Where we get very small proportions, we start to not be able to resolve it. So here, it was less than 10%. Um, we could see it was quite low, but we didn't really know exactly what the percentage was. So we think our cutoff here within populations is isolates that are present within the population at greater than 5% is approximately where our precision lies. And so we started to look at some populations. And this is one population. Um, so these are field populations this time around. And what we did here was run them through the system and see uh, what we could see. So this is the isolates that we saw in population one. Um, we found four isolates. The proportions are all about the same. Um, and these are the mutations that they carry. So different uh, insertions within the promoter region and different range of different uh, mutations. So this was a field population that was predominantly made up of four different isolates. The next population, this is again just an example, was a slightly more complex one. Uh, this time we saw five different isolates and at different proportions. So some of the isolates were rare and some were more common. I'm not going to bore you with loads more tables of the same looking types of results. Um, but indeed, we just tested a range of different field populations. And we can see complex and simple ones. Um, and our precision seems to be around about a 5% mark. Isolates that are present within the population are below that level. Uh, we're not really able to see very easily. OK, then, on to the summary of this piece of work. Um, by improving the pores and the base callers and the correction algorithms, we were able to reduce the errors. We still have some problem with homopolymers, um, but generally speaking, we were able to see the SNPs because we know what the changes are and where they are. So we were able to look at haplotypes in populations 
at frequencies above 5%, but low-frequency haplotypes were difficult to resolve. Now, that could be a problem because a low-frequency uh, haplotype in a population, when you spray it with something, if that's a resistant haplotype, could then become a major uh, player in a later um, population. The protocol is relatively fast and inexpensive. So a fungal allows us to do easily 10 populations per flow cell, equivalent to about $10 per sample per population. And it enables us to do it relatively uh, quickly. The last time go eat, you know, yours. You buy me food. You buy me food. No other. The last piece of work that I want to tell you about is some work that just started. So this is about fungicide selection and timing, and this is linking inoculum presence with spray selection and timing using spore sampling and testing. And this is work that's being done at the moment um, by Lucy Mallard. And what we're investigating is whether we can use spore sampling, and there's a whole range of ways that we can uh, collect spores in the field. These are just some examples um, from cyclone samplers uh, to Hearst samplers, rotor rod samplers, and down here, um, a pa relatively passive sampler that just points into the wind, called a spornado. Um, but what we were interested in, whether we can use automated uh, cyclone samplers. And so we worked with colleagues at the University of Hertfordshire to develop a system that would um, automatically test uh, the presence of spores. So in all of these samplers, um, you need to go out and collect the samples on a daily basis, bring them into the lab and do analysis. Um, you can leave the samplers out there for longer, but then you're getting less precision in your results. This sample is an interesting one because this automated uh, sampler takes samples every day for seven days. But of course, then you collect the samples and do testing, and you're now seven days behind the pathogen, which could be problematic. So we were interested in whether you could develop an automated sampler. So this would collect spores and also do the testing. Again, using lamp amplification. And what we did here was work with colleagues at the University of Hertfordshire to develop these cyclones. So what a cyclone is, is it directs the inflow. You, you suck air out of this port and you suck in air into this port. And based on the uh, dimensions of the cyclone, so the velocity of the air that as it exits, the diameter of the tube and the length of the tube enables you to selectively collect particles of a particular size. So Hertfordshire developed cyclones that were able to detect fungal spores. So they come in here, they go down to the bottom of the tube and uh, the spores are collected here and the air exits here. So you can see there's very many more here than there are here. So this is some modeling uh, to look at the diameter and the length of the uh, cyclone tube. And in fact, they then prototyped a whole range of them using 3D printing. This is just some examples. Uh, you can see in the pictures using various different uh, diameters of inlet and outlet uh, to optimize. To cut a long story short, uh, this is where we got to. So this is a prototype device here. This is the top of the cyclone sampler. So it sucks in air here. Uh, the spores are separated into those tubes. And then underneath here is some robotics that enables us to do lamp testing for those spores. So on a daily basis, we collect a spore sample, goes into the tubes, we do the testing, and that data is then transmitted uh, wirelessly into our smartphone um, or into some kind of decision support system. So we're getting a measure of the amount of pathogen that is around on a daily basis. And also on which days we're seeing pathogen. And that enables us to do two things. Firstly, it enables us to look at risk. So if there's a lot of pathogen, we've got a lot of risk and we might want to select our fungicide based on, on how risky we think it is. And also because we're looking at days, uh, we're looking at spores on a daily basis, we may be able to refine when we uh, spray the crop. 
So we're spraying it um, when the product is most effective. Because if you remember, I said most of these products are preventative, not curative. So it's no good spraying days after you've got infection. You want to spray at the same time that you see spores entering the crop. This is ongoing work. So um, this is a, a CAD diagram of the um, con co uh, commercial device here. So this has been developed by OptiSense Limited in the UK. You can see the cyclone tubes here and very much simplified um, the cyclone. The DNA is extracted here and is transferred into the reaction tubes here. And underneath here, we have a genie system that is doing lamp for us. So again, the air is coming into the top coming down through the cyclone, DNA is extracted, and we run the reaction at the bottom. And we're currently awaiting this for field trials. Uh, the prototype's been built already. And this is ultimately where we want to be. So the automated device uh, collects data, collects spores, does testing on a daily basis, tells us about it, and that informs our spraying. So it informs our spraying in terms of product selection, and also in terms of uh, timing of application. And we also want to bring all of this kind of technology together. I've shown you three different applications this morning. So uh, this kind of spore sensing, the use of uh, the genie system, the use of LFDs, and also the use of high throughput sequencing. I've also got colleagues at Newcastle looking at drones and spectral analysis to look at spatial variability. But as you've seen, the data from all of these different technologies is pretty complex. And what we really want to do is, is for our farmers to access this data and to be able to interpret it in terms of action. So we're also working on uh, something uh, that we call the digital agronomist, which is a smartphone application that takes these complex and uh, disparate pieces of data, joins them together, and then converts it into um, relatively simple kind of traffic light uh, information on risk. So green, amber, red, uh, risk to the farmer, uh, to hopefully enable better access to farmers to what ultimately is quite some quite complex uh, diagnostic data. And that's where I'm going to end, um, just with some acknowledgements. So a lot of people have been involved in this work. So in particular, I showed work from uh, Yaitha, uh, Lucy Mallard, uh, now Paul Nonkokasung, and Alina Golbo-Cavillari. Uh, all of the blackgrass work uh, is work that's been done in Rob Edwards' group, who's our head of school at Newcastle University. And we've got a whole range of uh, collaborators in the work, both at uh, Newcastle and also at Ferro Science Limited. There's a range of funders for the work. So we've got a joint institute between Newcastle and Ferro called IAFRI, uh, BBSRC, the Northern Accelerator and Innovate UK. And these are some of our commercial partners. Um, Ferro Science Limited, Velcourt, Agri, Genesis, the University of Hertfordshire and OptiSense. Thank you. Thank you. We use several different buffers. Um, the simplest one is an alkaline peg buffer. Um, so it's got polyethylene glycol, and it's a buffer that, that buffers slightly on the alkaline side, just enough to uh, break open uh, cells, but not too much. And you can, you can, uh, there's, a, there's another one which is much more alkaline, and we use this particular master mix that um, helps to buffer out the alkalinity in that extraction. Generally speaking, those buffers don't really impact amplification uh, by lamp, although they would work, uh, they would inhibit PCR. 
So there is a difference. Yes. Yeah. The best way of thinking about LAMP is that it's very similar to PCR. So the specificity of the reaction is based on the uh, sequences of the primers. And so, you know, you, you can develop uh, LAMP assays to basically anything that has DNA. And in fact, our early work was all based on Phytophtha, so Phytophtha Raymorum in particular. Uh, so yes, you can do that. So the, for lamp reactions, so if you think of PCR, you've got one pair of primers typically um, to make, make it work. With lamp, because of the mechanism that it works, if you go onto YouTube, you can see the cartoon explaining that, you actually need three pairs of primers uh, to make the mechanism work. So you have to design three pairs of primers. Um, you can't really use any more and you can't really use any less. You, you need be um, but the way that the primers are designed they, they've also asked how is it fixed um, is is very like PCR so you design them in a similar kind of a way it's just that you need three pairs instead of uh, one pair and there's lots of software out there that enables you to do that Yes, um, I talked mostly about Septoria because that's where we've been focused. Um, but you, the, the spore samplers um, all detect, the, the cyclone samplers are not that, they're, they're reasonably specific for size, but they collect spores of uh, actually a range of sizes. So the way that we've set it up is that the range of sizes for fungal spores, so actually collects um a whole range of different pathogens and also those background fungi that are, that are just floating around in the air all of the time you will also get some background for other things that are, are floating around in the air so some spore samplers have a problem with particulate matter in particular coming from uh, combustion engines so if you have a problem with air pollution some of that pollution can cause problem with with PCR amplification because it's very inhibitory, but is trapped by spore samplers. So you do need to. It, it is quite. It's trapping particles of a certain size. So yes, on the fungal uh, species, but be aware that it can detect other things as well. Yeah, uh, the use of a liver. Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. All of these methods have their places. Um, so if you're wanting to look for um, a very large number of samples at a low cost, and the amount of pathogen you're detecting is within the detection range of ELISA, then ELISA is a really excellent method uh, for detection, in particular for many virus species. Um, what I would say is the issue with ELISA testing is where you encounter new, say, new viruses or new pathogens because of the cost of making antibodies and the time that it takes to make those antibodies. So sometimes when when you get an emerging disease it's easier to use a molecular method because you can design primers quickly and cheaply um, but it may be necessary in the longer term to also develop antibodies and use an ELISA system down the line so we quite often use both Yes. Yep. 
Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the the aim there is that you've got eight different tubes for each DNA, so you could test for eight different pathogens. Yeah. Nice. Very good. Yep. I mean, we're always open to collaborating. Um, you know, the key problem is usually money. So, where can we find money that we can both apply for? To enable collaborations, but I'm certainly happy to discuss with anybody. Uh, just send me an email. Okay, set. So I can wait uh, in double haploid also. Sometimes we want international. Uh, sometimes, sir, we want international collaborators. So we don't have because we are just emerging scientists. So that's why I was just asking. I would say not yet. Um, not yet. Um, so whilst the machine, the, the sequencer itself is very small, and as you saw the picture, you connect it to a laptop. Uh, so for sure, you can run that almost anywhere where you have internet access. Problem is, you need quite a bit of sample processing before then. And that is really best done in a lab. So you will see there are some papers out there of people doing min-ion sequencing in the, in the field. But I think routinely, it's not really a point of care diagnostic yet. But hopefully, it will be in the near future. Me too. <laughs> Hi, John. Very good, thank you.
Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. So great pleasure. Bye.